Isn't it an awesome day to be in the house of the Lord? Well, why don't you stand as we enter into worship? the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the
today. Come on. Good morning. Welcome to the church at South Edmonton. This is your opportunity. Turn to your neighbor. Greet someone new. Make some lunch plans. Come on. Talk to that new girl across the aisle.
want you to make your way back to your seats. If this is your first time here or your first time in a while, my name is Chantelle and I am one of the volunteers here at the church at South Edmonton. This is my home church. We've been here for the past 13 years building God's kingdom and I couldn't be happier. So if this is your first time here, we want to get to know you. We want to make that connection so that you feel uh, in, embraced. And we have lots of ministries that run throughout the week that we want to let you know, know about. So you can do that by filling out a connect card. There's a card in the seat pocket in front of you. Fill it out. Drop it off at the hub after the service. We have someone there that's ready to greet you. And if you're watching online, you can fill out the Connect card by hopping onto our website. And you know what? If you live in the Edmonton area, come on down. We want to meet you. We want you to get involved with what we are doing here in the city of Edmonton. Amen? Okay. One of the other things that we do here at this church at South Edmonton is we believe in the power of prayer. We be, believe in the power of prayer in numbers. So if there is something that you... Uh, have on your heart you want to share with us you can email us at prayer at the church sc.com alternatively if you have something that you want to share about the goodness of God in your life we need to make that testimony because it's our job our testimony helps build the faith of others come on so if you have something you want to share a get involved with what we're doing here, and B, you can email us. We'd love to share it on your behalf. One of the other things that we do at the Church of South Edmonton, oh my gosh, we have so many core values. If you exit out these main doors here, you're gonna see on the wall it says, we honor up, down, and all around. So if you don't know what that means, that means, and we you can actually go on our website, we had a sermon about it about two or three weeks ago about honoring in the kingdom. Respect is earned, but honor is freely given. So we want to honor today one of our volunteers. Come on. This volunteer has been attending the church for the past 13 years. She shows up early. She lights the candles. She puts the communion cups on the seats. She helps clean up. Linda McNaughton, would you get your little self up here? We love you so much. Everybody stand and let's just recognize all of the work that Linda puts in. Come on up here, girl. We love you so much and we couldn't do it without you. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> You're a big part of our church and we love you so much. Okay, you guys may have a seat. This is how we do it. This is case, people. The last thing I want to talk to you about today is generosity. So not only do we talk about tithing on a regular basis because it's one of our core one of our core values. You're like, man, you guys got so many core values. We do because we're principled people. We love the Lord. We read the Bible. Okay. You guys, today is the first of the month. What does that mean? Oh my gosh, it's the Justice Fund. Can I read some scripture for you guys? Would you be okay with that? Okay. I want to talk to you guys about Elijah and the widow's oil. So now one of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried to Elijah, your servant who was my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elijah said to her, what do you want me to do for you? Well, tell me, whatever you have in your house. And she said, I don't have anything except for a jar of oil. So Elijah said to her, go outside and borrow those vessels from your neighbors. Make sure they're empty and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and, and you and your sons will pour into these vessels. And once one is full, set it aside. Once the other is full, set it aside. 
so on and so forth. So she went from him, she shut the door behind him. Her and her sons got as many vessels as they could and they poured, began to pour into it. And she kept saying, bring me another vessel, bring me another vessel. But the oil did not stop flowing. Then she came and told the Son of God, excuse me, she told the Son of Man, go and sell all of your oil, pay your debts, and you and your son can live on the rest. Okay, so there's a couple of ways that we could probably interpret this scripture. So many people like to focus on the woman, the woman and how many vessels she had, and the oil kept flowing until she had no more. But what I wanna focus on today is the man, the husband, the servant. Scripture clearly says he was a servant of God. Other translations say he was a fervent man of God. Another translation says he was a generous man. This man, although he was gone and although he passed away, he stored up his treasures in heaven. We know that being a God-fearing person means that we live by godly principles. Fearing the Lord is seeking wisdom and generosity. He stored up his treasures in heaven where moth and earth cannot destroy. The point I'm trying to make here today is that God is working on a plan for all of us but it's in his time. So the things that we do and the actions we take and the investments we make here on earth, maybe you might reap your harvest here on earth, maybe not. But in God's kingdom economy, it does not go to waste and it will be reaped in the generations to come. We get to sit here today in a building that was paid on the backs of people that came before us. So I want to encourage you here today that when you are giving, you are thinking about the next generation to come and we are laying down the, the blocks for people to come after us to be successful. So the Justice Fund, if you are new here and you've never heard of this, it is a separate fund. We pour into it once a month and we will give to people who are in need of those essential items, food, clothing, shelter. So those requests pour in and our church is ready. We are ready to help those people. This is, there's so many organizations out there that take a cut right? Administration fees. I'm really proud to say that the Justice Fund through the Church at South Edmonton takes zero administration fees, which means that 100% of what you are giving is going to help someone else in need. So if that is on your heart today, I want to thank you. I want to honor you. I want to pray for you. There are ways you can give at the back. There's a booth set up to receive debit, check, cash, credit, all the things. You can email an e-transfer to give at thechurchse.com or through the portal on our website. So if that's you, I want to pray for you. Father God, I just thank you that you have made us a generous people. Father God, we thank you for the things you have given to us, that we have more than enough. Father God, we just pray for these blessings that you would multiply them further than we could ever ask dream or imagine and that people would know your name because of the work that is happening here in this church in Jesus name amen i
you can take a seat while we prepare our hearts to receive communion. When God was preparing the Israelites to take them out of Egypt, they were instructed not to use yeast to make their bread. He said, I want you to make unleavened bread because if anyone knows when you're making bread, in order to get it to rise, you have to add a little bit of yeast or a little bit of culture, depending on the bread that you're making. But then you have to wait and you have to let that bread rise. And it could take a couple of hours and depending on the situation, depending on, um, I lost my notes here. Depending on time, temperature, the water, it could give or take a little bit longer. And if you don't get it just right, then that bread will fall flat. It's kind of finicky. So God instructed them to make their bread unleavened because that he knew that when the time came and he moved his mighty arm, that he would deliver them from Egypt, that they would not have time to wait for the bread to rise. They had to be ready to go at any moment. He was saying, I want you to be ready. I want you to be prepared. So fast forward to the Last Supper. Jesus broke the bread, a piece for every single person sitting at the table, representing his body. It was broken for you. He was beat, battered, whipped, a stripe for every sickness and disease, a crown of thorns pushed onto his head so that he could heal and restore you. So that we could find rest in him. Let's take the bread. Next, Jesus took the cup, representing his blood that was spilled for you. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus spilt his perfect blood. By the piercing of his side, you are covered. I am covered. He hung there for six hours, fulfilled dozens of prophecies so that you could become righteous. Don't miss that personal pronoun. He did this for you. Let's take the cup. Jesus said that as often as you do it, whenever you do it, you are remembering him. You are proclaiming victory over death. He sent his one and only son. Jesus was actually God's tithe to the earth. It was his most generous gift, the best of him, so that we could have eternal life. Jesus came to earth, took on flesh and bones, was crucified, was brutally beaten, was buried in a dead man's grave, went down to hell, took back the keys to the kingdom, came back three days later, and has victory over death. 
And as we take communion together as a church, we are retelling that story. We are proclaiming his name is above all other names. Not only is this the meal of remembrance, but it's the meal of rest. We can rest in him knowing that it has been completed and there is nothing that we need to do other than believe in his name, which is above all other names. And today we take communion so that we can be in line with Jesus, so that we can be in line with the word that we are living out like Jesus did, so that when God moves his mighty hand in an instant, we are ready. We are one with him. We are communing with him every day. Would you guys stand to your feet again as we enter back into worship? Jesus, we just thank you for what you have done for us that we can't do for ourselves. We just thank you that we can commune with you every day, every moment that we walk in the spirit with you, Lord, that you are constantly talking to us, you are constantly sharing with us, Lord, that we would be a testimony to others, that you would use us, work through us, Jesus. We are here for you, that other people would see your name, Lord, and you would have the glory. Amen. Cause you stepped into my Egypt and you took me by the hand and you marched me out of freedom into the promised land. Remember when I'm weak, the 
fear may come, but fear will leave. You led my heart to victory. You are my strength. he's been so faithful to you little things big things it doesn't matter what it is but he's always so faithful and he's he's always there for you he's always there for me he's always there for all of us and we can take a moment and just worship him and tell him tell him how much you love him because he is good he's a good dad and he's a good father he went to the cross for us. Is that enough? Should be enough. But he goes farther and he takes care of us in every little situation, whether it's big or small. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. 
I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. The reign of darkness now is ended In the kingdom of light In the kingdom of light Forever under your dominion You're the king of my life You're the king of my life You reign above it all You reign above and over every yard cause there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all and on the cross the work was finished God you poured out your life just to give us new life and from of your forgiven here and after my rise cause Jesus you're darkness running out of an empty grave now sing it alone in glory and throne on the highest praise cause you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated it alone in glory and throne on the highest praise cause you sent the darkness running out of an
song Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one Cause there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all Sickness has to flee, disease has to flee Generational curses have to flee. Childhood trauma, you have no home here. Why? Because Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns in this place. We claim hope. We claim peace. We have love in Jesus' name. Enemy has to flee. You are not welcome here. Anyone else agree? Come on. Father God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this service. We just pray that you your Holy Spirit would rest on us, that our hearts and our ears would be opened, that the message would go down deep and bear good fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can take a seat. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. They played the whole time. Even during both my messages, you guys are probably sick of me. So I'm going to turn the mic over to our special speakers for today. Now, if you are new to the church at South Edmonton or you haven't been here in a while, we are a church that believes in developing, digging out the gold, we um, equip and release. So what we've done here is we have curated a team of speakers. We were so uh, fortunate to hear last month on Thanksgiving Day, we got to hear from our speaking team and we had a lot of fun. Who else was here? It was fantastic. So we have that opportunity again. We get to hear from our speaking team. Today we have two speakers, so they get a little bit extra time. But if they go over, I'm gonna, you're going to see me. I'm going to come up here and push you off stage. Just kidding. <laughs> So the topic that we're talking about today is serving, having a servant heart. Uh, I am happy to introduce, but before we do that, <laughs> I need support from you guys, from the congregation, because coming up and speaking is one of the most terrifying things a person can do. It doesn't matter how much time you practice, in the mirror, or maybe you practice with your friend or your spouse, but it's very, very difficult. So we want, from the congregation, your encouragement, your cheers, your excitement, because we have curated this loving and embracing place for people to develop their giftings. Okay? Yes. Let's hear it. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce our two speakers today, Derek Koop and Stefan Artis. Thank you so much, Chantel. And thank you so much, church, for worshiping together. Um, and yeah, I have the privilege of talking this morning about um, serving. And when we were planning this uh, discussion topic, the first thing that popped into my head was the next generation. Because God put it on my heart when I was younger to, to love and serve young people. And um, I'm so fortunate now in a position here at the church as the uh, director of youth ministries that I get to do that and uh, create space for them to experience the love of Christ, um, something that I'm so passionate about. And so when it comes to serving the next generation, it's all about passing it on, passing the baton on to the next generation. And we know this as a foundational concept in developing leaders. Should have pre-cracked this. So, whether you are running a relay race or you are training someone in your place of work, passing on the knowledge and the skills that you've gained over the years in the position that you were in 
is essential to making sure that the mission and the work continues after your time in that position is done. Um, and I, I would love to take this opportunity to share a bit about my story because, um, well, haven't really had a lot of chance to talk with every single person here, but my story is something that I love to share because I love sharing my experience with how God saved my life, how Jesus came into my life and rescued me. And it was through mentorship. It was through somebody older than me stepping into a mentorship relationship with me that guided me into knowing who Jesus is. But when I was younger, um, unfortunately in our family, my father left and I wasn't able to uh, be raised in a house that had both my parents and that left a huge hole in my life. And, you know, many, many, I'm sure many of you in this room understand and can, can relate to feeling like you don't have something, feeling that thing in your soul that you're like, I, I, something's missing, what is it? And so when I was a young teen, I went looking. And the first thing and the easiest thing to find when you go looking is trouble. And I stumbled and I fell into a dark, dark place. I struggled with addiction for many years. And I struggled with mental health problems um, due to, due to the, like, you know, substance abuse issues as well as just longing and seeking for something more. And when that gap in my life didn't get filled, didn't get filled up by the, by the drugs or by the toxic relationships that I had, I just went deeper into darkness. But as we've talked about so much today, God is faithful. God is faithful to the people he has called. And God put, uh, God put me in a family where I had a mom that really, really loved me. And she, she, out of faith, went to this youth pastor at our church. And she said, can you help my son? And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> but I can try. Um, and so he showed up one day, um, and he was like, hey, I talked to your mom. I'm a youth pastor. And... She just mentioned that you were going through a tough season. Can I meet with you once in a while? And I was like, well, I don't really want to hang out with an old person. But he said, but I'll take you out for lunch. And I was like, sure. I'm in. Um, so he, he stepped into relationship with me. And he began to walk with me um, weekly. And we'd go out for lunch and we'd talk. And we would sometimes talk about nothing. Sometimes we'd talk about the simple things of life, sports, the weather. But other times we'd talk about my, the deep, deep struggles that I was experiencing in my heart. Those, I began to open up to him about the, the people I was spending my time with, the, the, um, yeah, just the crowds I was with that was leading me down this dark, dark path. And he never shied away from a relationship with me. He only ever stepped deeper and deeper, deeper into knowing who I was. And he genuinely cared and loved, and loved me. So, after about a year, entire school year, of walking and hanging out with this youth pastor, he invited me out to a camp. And I went to this camp reluctantly, um, but with the promise of food, I went. <laughs> the message here is that if you feed people, they'll, they'll come, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, I went to this camp, and it was through this camp that he was speaking at that I got to encounter Jesus for the first time. But the coolest thing is, is that when I encountered Jesus, when Jesus revealed himself to me, it wasn't 
this brand new thing because I've been experiencing the love of Christ this whole time through, through the love that he showed me. Because God uses mentor relationships to change lives. And through service, young people can understand and come to know who he is. Because I'm not here to talk about serving young people. I'm talking about serving for the sake of the next generation. Because without passing it on to the next generation, we will lose them. And we see it in scripture. We can read about um, Joshua in his life. And Joshua was raised up by Moses to lead the Israelites into the promised land. And Joshua did that. He was faithful and he was a man of character and led the people into the promised land and conquered it. And that was the mission. The mission was to go into the promised land and conquer it so that the people of Israel could live there. And when it came time for Joshua's time of leading Israel to end, the mission was complete. Right? They went in, they conquered, and life was good. And we read, um, you can see it on the screen here, in jo- uh, Judges 2, verses 6 to 8, to start. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went, to, went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at age 110. Now there's a key part in there that these people that were with Joshua saw what God has done. They knew what what God had done for Israel. And then they, then they dispersed. They spread out into the land. But then all of the people in that generation passed on and went to be with their ancestors. We can read in Judges 2.10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. They passed on. And there arose another generation, the next generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Now our our mind, when I read this, my mind went immediately to where we're at right now. That it is so important to pass on the good things that Jesus and that, that God has done for us in order for the next generation to know. Because if we don't, we can read it right here, they won't know. They won't. And maybe that's bold. Maybe that's bold of me to say. But I believe that we're at a critical moment. And in verse 11, it says, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. It didn't take much time either. It didn't make, take much time for them to completely forget and abandon what God had done for them. It was almost like, did, 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 I, I wonder sometimes when I read this passage, did they forget? Were they never told? Did they not have the proper tools in order to do the work that God had put in motion? It was as if they were living in a time of harvest, but had never once ever sown or cultivated the land. Because church, it takes work. It takes work in order to pass on to the next generation. And like I said earlier, we're at a critical moment. For those of you who don't know, so after I got, um, uh, growing up as an older teen in faith, I, um, God brought me to university and I studied social work. And I'm a social worker. And through that experience as a social worker, I got to work with the at-risk youth here in the city, here in Edmonton. And I saw firsthand where the young people are at. And maybe some of you guys know 
where the young people are at right now. But might I suggest that it's actually much more severe than we might realize. You see, in our downtown core, this year alone, we've seen a 20% increase from last year of needed access for homeless shelters and for food support, housing support. It is a major problem. And when I was working in social work, one of the jobs I had was to work with youth who had committed crimes. And so they would come into the office and I would work with them and, and I would discuss with them what they were gonna do as their community service um, so that they could move through the justice system without having to go to jail. And I worked with this one teen and when they came into my office, I was confused because I thought that I was, this per surely this person's too old. And they looked as if they would be like 40 years old and I'm not exaggerating. And then I pulled up their file. It turns out they were 17 and had been hustling on the streets for drugs for since they were 13. And the effect that that has because of the emptiness and the, and the, they're, they're lost and they're searching. And like, just like me, when you search, the quickest thing that you can find is trouble. And the reality is, is I, I saw myself in, in these teens. I saw my own experience in them because I also searched and found trouble and it led me down a dark, dark path. But the reality is, is that, yeah, there's these shelters and these youth centers in our city and um, the, uh, there's a few youth centers in our city that specialize in housing and finding housing supports for youth and they have wait lists that are over a year long. This problem with the young people in our city is, is serious. It's quite, it, we're, like I said, we're at a critical moment. Because yeah, these centers are great and they're wonderful and they do good work, but the reality is, is that I know from personal experience that they will never come to be saved and truly delivered unless they experience the love of Christ and the power of the gospel the redemptive, saving power of the gospel. So what do we do? Because it sounds pretty grim. It might sound like there's no hope. It might feel like, how could there possibly be anything that we can do to stop this from happening or to, or to, to do better? And then some of you might be thinking that I'm supposed to pass on God's work to the next generation. But God says in his word that the, wor the, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Because in order to reach that next generation, we need workers. We need people to step up and step out in faith to reach and care for young people. Because if we don't, we'll lose them and then we'll have an entire generation that doesn't know what God did. What God has done in each one of your guys' lives. And Jesus models how we can partner and walk with people. He does four things. He gathers, he instructs, he empowers, and then he entrusts. So Jesus gathers, we see it in Matthew 4, that he went down to the Sea of Galilee. And he, and he saw Simon, who was, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were fishing, they were casting their nets into the sea. And he said to them, follow me. Come with me. And, and, and do what I do. And immediately they left, they, they left their nets and followed him. And what I really love about this passage is that Jesus isn't waiting in the temple for holy people to, to, to be his disciples. Jesus goes down to where the people are, at their place of work, to call them to himself. The next thing Jesus does is he instructs and he demonstrates. In the next few chapters of Matthew, we see the Sermon on the Mount, which is an uninterrupted 
chunk of scripture where Jesus is preaching and teaching. And the disciples are there. They're there and they're watching so that they may do the work that Jesus is preparing them for. Matthew 10, verse 1, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal every disease and every affliction. He empowered them. He said, you've seen what I've done. You've seen the work that I'm preparing you to do. Now go do it, and I'll be with you. And the last thing he does is he entrusts them. And I feel like this is sometimes the hardest part. The, the part where you say, okay, you've seen, you've seen me do this work and you've done it. Now I'm going to not do it anymore. And you are going to do it. But Jesus demonstrates this for a reason. John 20, verses 21 to 22. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them the secret weapon. The Holy Spirit was inside of them and that they could access the power in order to do the work that he had been doing, that he modeled for them. And this is the call. The call to action from Jesus is not to stand idly by and, and hope that the next generation will rise up and take on the mantle and carry on building his church. It's to step in and do it with them so that we can pass it on well. Matthew 9, verse 37, again. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I can't stress this enough, church. We need workers. We need people willing to step in and step up and serve, not not just serve young people, but for the sake of the next generation. Because it is through your faithful service, whether you are at the front door or lighting the candles, that young people would see your act of faithful service and be inspired. They would see that and be like, I want to do what they do. And then, and then, you go out and you, you, you invite them to serve with you. Invite them to serve alongside of you. Empower them to do the work and then pass it on. To pass it on to them and trust that God has prepared them for that role. And that, and that model is not just for pastorship. That model is for every little job that is required because we're all part of one body. There's many parts of the body and that no one part is more significant than the other. So, so faithfully serve for the sake of a generation. Now to close, I have a special announcement. I talked earlier about the kind of the situation that we have downtown that we have in our city and how young people right now need, need to know Christ. And they need space to know him. They need to have a place where they can go so that they can experience that love, the same love that saved me, the same love that brought me out of darkness so that they may be brought out of darkness as well. I'm so excited to announce that on January 10th, we're actually opening up 9910 for an after-school drop-in program. Because God put it on my heart when, I, when he saved me to do that work, to do the same work that God did through my youth pastor for other kids, for other youth, so that they may know him, so that he may be glorified. through being there in that space, our hope is that kids would come 
and they would feel nothing but the love of Christ. They would feel nothing but the love of Christ through love, through love of their peers and their love of leaders and the love that their community is showing to them through our church. So church, if you're sitting here and you're wondering, well, I don't know where to serve, come hang out with the youth. Come spend time with the youth. That might look like you just check, you're just helping checking kids in. Or it might look like you are going out once a week with a kid for coffee, just listening to them. And don't belittle what that little act, might, it might seem little, but it's not. It's so significant. It, 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 it saved my life. It really, really did. So serving not for the sake of the young people so that they have a place to hang out and have fun, but ser- serving for the sake of a generation so that they might know Christ. Sharing your story with them. Empowering them to, to step into leadership. It takes all of us. Thank you. Amen. I'd like to invite Stevan, my dear friend Stevan, up. It's been such an honor being able to do this with him. I feel like we've sharpened each other. And yeah. yeah, amen, brother. Awesome. Let me make sure I'm on. One, two, one, two. One, two. Good? Good. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Derek. That's awesome, bro. And thanks all of you guys. And this morning, as we're talking about serving, I think uh, it's very fitting and special that this uh, weekend is all about remembrance, right? Remembrance Sunday, remembrance Saturday. And our service members have a special place in my heart. Both of my grandfathers served, and uh, my dad served. And it's just something special that we can easily take for granted when we live in a life of luxury, not knowing the things that they gave and the things that they did overseas. So we just take... It's a blessing when we get to take time to think about that and reflect on those. And that, and that goes for even our law enforcement, our first responders, everybody who's just like serving and giving their time and their life. And they could be doing many of other things. To, so we have the blessing and the safety to have church. <laughs> so uh, with that, we're going to get into serving. And I think it's fitting to start off with this one. I had to. I had to. Papa Kelly's not here. <laughs> Papa Kelly's not here, so I had to. I had to pop this one on. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for a husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, this is really funny. His right's really funny and really good. Yeah, well, watch this. Watch this. This is really funny because, like, as, like, Christian husbands, young, new Christian husbands, it's like, dude, we got the scripture on lock. All the different translations. We remember, we're like, boom. Hey, baby, the Bible says I'm the boss. <laughs> but, but that's something that's really important, though. Check this one, next one out. This next one out that we overlook sometimes. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I think this one's really important and it's really awesome because, like, you know, uh, my dad and a few really good wise men told me, you know, like, yeah, you're the head of the home, but your wife's the neck. She can turn you any way she wants to go. And it's like, well, but they were right in more ways than ones, because, like, my wife is the only woman who could turn my head. So, just saying. But when we look at the scripture, we can't just overlook it. It's actually really powerful, because, like, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's very easy to look at that in the relationship perspective, right? In the husband and wife thing, we're having fun with it. But in a more serious sense, the scripture really has everything we need to direct our conduct yeah. as a society, as a people. Yeah. Let's look at what, like, what Christ does for the church. Really, right? Like he came with and all this power. He could have stayed up in the storm. He could have just like, bam, man. But like, as Christians, we're all a bunch of broken people, man. Like we mess up like all the time, time and time and time again. And, like, he really came with just, like, patience and grace and loving and listening. And, like, a lot of times, like, I really believe you can't really talk about, we can't just talk about serving without talking about leadership. It goes hand in hand. And I was at this conference, 
And I heard this, a speaker said this. Leadership, the art of getting people to do something you want done and they want to do it. Yeah. Ew, that's, that's, that's one way to put it. <laughs> but I, to me, to me, I think that, had, that sounds, to me, that sounds a lot like manipulation, right? It's, it's good for a bit. You get them to do something you want them to do, and they're doing it. It's a lot to do with manipulation. I think how Christ teaches us as leaders, it looks more like this. It looks more like this. Leadership, the art of directing and uniting others towards achieving a common goal. A true leader nurtures, inspires, improves, loves, listens, empathizes, and serves his people. That's what a true leader is. Like I said, you want to show me a great leader, I'll show you a greater servant. It's very important. And like, who is history's greatest leader? It's also history's greatest servant. It's God. Here we look at, this is a demonstration of that first quote. This is like the mindset of like world leadership. Getting people to do something we want done and they want to do it. Tricking them by any means necessary, but everything points back to me, myself, and I. Don't care how I get there. I get there. My people will go. Lead me off the cliff, over the hill. I don't care. My soldiers are expendable and people are expendable. They just come in. Okay, whatever, whatever. I need everything to point back to myself. I'm the leader. I'm the champion. Myself and I. I'm the boss, right? But this is how God's leadership looks. Make no mistake. Jesus is king. Jesus sits on the throne. But this is what his heart is like. He comes down to our level, right? When he came down and died on the cross, you know, in business and, you know, like in manlyhood, right? In manly relationships, we say, yo, bro, meet me halfway. <laughs> you know, meet me halfway. I'll tell you right now, none of us can meet Christ halfway. None of us. We're just not going to do that. We can't, we can't make it. You cannot, it's no way, no ifs, ands, or buts. We're not going to make it. He came down to our level to serve us, to empathize with us, to build us up. To come with that heart, with a servant's heart. Jesus, history's greatest leader, history's greatest servant. A true leader has the heart of a servant. Here's this little scripture to kind of just dig into that a little bit. Christ the servant in Philippians. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection, sympathy, complete my job by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord of one mind, but do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who though he was in the form of God, though he was on the top of the throne, the king, the great I am, did not count us equally with, with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeliness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And that's just like, this is something really cool. So I like to show Stevi all these awesome videos. And me and Kayla, we try to like give them educational things, right? There's so much technology around them in life. And it's like you're, you're either going to try to avoid it and show to them like a bubble under the rock from them, or you're going to direct it and use it as a tool. I believe technology is a tool. It's how we use it. It's like how we have all these lights here. We have all these instruments. We have all this awesome gear up here. When we can use these tools, we can use it to edify the church, lift the church up, to really learn these more lessons and grow closer to God. So this is a really cool thing. When I was watching, I just had this like instructional video playing over and over, and I heard something that was like really inspiring and awesome to me. Did you know that we all actually live inside the sun? Well, inside the atmosphere of the sun. I thought it was pretty incredible. So, and it's really funny because, like, I know we speak the English language, but this is really cool. I just like the idea of it. They're like, hey, that actually is, like, a lot like Jesus. It's like, like, look where Earth is. If we were, if we were closer, we would be uninhabitable. Like, let's think about when Moses saw the bush. Bam! His hair turned white. He couldn't take that. <laughs> he couldn't take that. So imagine if we get too close to the sun, we're done, right? You get far away from you get far away from Christ, far away from God, uninhabitable. You're cold, your life, bum, stone cold, you're dead, man. You're just like, you ain't, you ain't living, you're dead. And, and but when you're in that right place, right where Christ has us in a perfect place, right? And humility and let Christ grow us and nurture us and build us up. We're alive and we're thriving. That's good, 
right? That was a really good thing. It was like, I thought, I thought the sermon was like done. We had it all written out and whatever. And like, then like on Saturday morning, he's watching his little instructional show. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like I hear it. I have to go back to that. I'm like, what? <laughs> so it was like really cool. It's like, I just love how the fact of how like there's that scripture in Proverbs. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but honor of kings to search out the matter. It's like God has all these beautiful mysteries and relations and everything's relative. It's all pointing back. And well, and if you just take time to really study pretty much anything in nature, you can't help but see God's identity all over it <laughs> and God's plan in it. If we, if we could just study one thing, you could study a leaf and you got a whole sermon series on it. <laughs> it's a lot of beautiful art. Like God is the ultimate masterpiece, master artist. And so here's some things that's pretty awesome, this list. Jesus, history's greatest leader, history's greatest servant. What are you serving? All of us. Are we serving our own pride, our own ego, our own lust, our own greed? Who are we serving? Are we serving me, myself, and I? Are we serving God? Are we served by, by serving each other? Are we just serving the almighty dollar? What are we invested in? You know, it's like, show me, this is some great quotes, man. It's like, show me where you spend your time, I'll show you where you're invested in. You know, like, I love sports. This is a nice big water cup, it's a Stanley Cup. I'm doing my part bringing a Stanley Cup to Edmonton. <laughs> we need some help right now. So, anyway, so, like, as much as I know about sports, I have to check myself because it's like, a lot of times, especially football, I know so many details about historic players, Hall of Fame players. I know who's coming into the draft. I know all that stuff, right? Stats, yards, and all that stuff, or whatever. But it's like, my goodness, like, I need to be spending that much time and more time knowing about everyone in the Bible, the scriptures, knowing God's word. My wife is amazing. Like, she's my teammate number one. And she's like, she has, she's like a scripture memory verse book herself. She's like, bam, 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 bam. She has them all around here. Me, a lot of times, it's like, honestly, I can't constantly just re-quote exactly the verse, chapter, name, bam, 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 bam. But I have, everything's connected in my mind. It's like, just like all over the place. But I can't just go in and grab anything out of the file cabinet. It's pretty messy. I got to look around sometimes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> this, this is really cool. Now, just, I wanted to clarify just some points of how, like, what God is speaking to us in serving. You know, we got to have anything, anything we do, anything we do, right, we got to have it in order. We got to have the direction. God loves order, right? He has his balance if everything's going. We got to do a heart check and a mind check and focus. We have to know who's the king, right? So in Galatians 1.10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of, or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Yeah. A lot of us get mixed up sometimes and become people pleasers thinking we're doing God a favor, thinking we're doing ourselves a favor. When, if we put anybody before God, that is wrong, right? And I tell you, that was a big stumbling block of mine for a long time because, like, I just, like, listening to everybody and, like, trying to make everybody happy, make everybody smile. And then, like, hey, like, if you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason, you're doing the wrong thing. If, it's, if that right thing is not what God wants, what's socially right is not what God wants, what's politically right is not what God wants, what seems to be the right action is not what God wants, no matter what, you're doing the wrong thing. So you got to make sure that you're in line doing what God wants you to do first. And then this one's pretty cool. This kind of, now this one helps us when we're with our employers, right? We're at work with our bosses, with our coworkers, with our managers, Right, with our awesome head pastors. We have an awesome new head pastor coming in soon. And it's like with our church council here, right? It's like just this is respecting those who are above us, who are in authority. Right? Servants, obey in all, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye servants as men pleasures, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of your inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. When we're doing, when we're being obedient, we're being respectful to those in authority, we are honoring Christ. As long as what they're telling us to do does not go against our first king, our first master, our first boss, number one. Right? Amen? So this, this is a cool scripture. So 
for those of you guys who know, on Thursdays, we have an awesome Bible study. Yeah. Happens day over there. And like my buddy Derek was saying, we got food. So and we got good people who made the good food too, and it, and it takes some good eating. And so it's like, let me just read this scripture real quick because it's pretty cool. So it's like 1 John 2.16. Right now we're going through the book of John. It's do not, we're going to the book of 1 John, sorry. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does, the will of God abides forever. I thought this was really important and worked really perfect with this idea in mind. Here are some of the things that can really distract us and inhibit us from serving properly. Can inhibit us from serving God, from inhibit us from serving each other. Right? The lust of the eyes, flesh, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Our very own Mr. Perry Friesen, <laughs> during the Bible study, had a, made a really good note, <laughs> and I wrote it down. I was like, man, I need to take a picture of it. See, you got to come to Bible study. You never know you're going to get some really cool, influential, gold things, man, you carry the rest of your life. And it's, like, really awesome because, like, me and my brother, Derek, we bounce off each other really, really good. And it's, like, I feel really comfortable talking and talking and talking and talking for, like, a long time. I have to work on, like, shortening things down. Derek is really good going straight to the point, man. He's like, shoo, hey, shoo, 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 hits the target right on point. And it's really awesome because when we're looking at scripture, in my mind, when we're studying it, you know, I had like just oh, all these long notes. I was really looking at it. I was like taking a bunch of notes and stuff. But then when I heard Perry break it down that simple, it was like, yeah, wow, like that one, that's very profound to put it there. The lust of the eyes looks good. Lust of the flesh feels good. Pride of life. I am good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those things really do get in the way of us, man. They really do stump us. It's one of the biggest stumbling blocks of ourselves, right? Here's some scripture to back that up and kind of dive into it. Lust of the eyes. Looks good. Proverbs 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. When we live our life trying to fulfill that lust of the eyes, trying to get more, 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 chasing after all those things that look good, well... Your eyes ain't never going to be done. It's always going to be one more. You'll never be fulfilled. You're never going to find what you're really looking for. Less of the flesh. Feels good for a moment. Proverbs 5, 323. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in hunting comb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as one word, warm word, sharp as a two-edged sword, and her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. And society today, this is actually championed. Like right now, we're literally celebrating a lot of this flesh business. It's a lot of garbage that is like breaking relationships. It's becoming pro like legally profitable and celebrated. But we know when we live a life chasing after just the flesh, what feels good for a moment, ultimately, verse 5, takes you right down to hell. Just separates you. Because we know from Scripture. Again, if anyone who's here in the Bible study, we were really talking about that fact that like, the flesh wars against the spirit. Right. Only one, only one can lead. It's going to be the flesh when we idolize the flesh. It's literally pushing us to hell because it's the furthest away from God. It's pushing us further and further away. Pride of life, I am good. This is where you get your arrogance, man. Yeah. This is where you get your egos. You're unteachable because you know it all. Right? You just can't learn. You're, you can't receive things. You can't, you can't be corrected. And in battle, you can't even see what's coming at you. Because, <laughs> again, you think, I am good. I don't need to defend myself. I know everything. <laughs> so, Proverbs 21, verse 26. There is a treasure to be desired, and oil in the dwelling of the wise. But a foolish man spendeth it up. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness and honor. A wise man scaleth the city of the mighty, mighty and casteth down the strength of confidence thereof. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Yeah. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who deals in proud wrath. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He covereth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Look at some of those points there. 
to 25 inside of the slothful. I'm good. I don't need to do nothing. So pride, ego, he doesn't want to go out and hard work hard with his hands. He's too arrogant, too much pride to humble himself and go get a job, to humble himself and work underneath somebody, to humble himself to learn so somebody would want to hire the dude. Because he already thinks, I am good. I'm owed everything. Everybody owes me. Everybody's, the world is out to get me if the world is not for me. Yeah. Now, I told you guys I love sports. <laughs> hey, I had to use it, right? It's honest. A really cool lesson that my dad taught me. It was like, okay, if you're going to love sports, if you're going to love video games, you're going to have to constantly show me how it relates to scripture, how it relates to life. If it's not beneficial, if you're just watching it for the sake of being a consumer, no TV, no sports. So you have to, you have to find ways to relate it to life. So I grew up doing that. So anyways, <laughs> it's really awesome. In football, one of my favorite sports, we have all these different positions. My homie Derek, he talked about we're many members, right, in the body. And God calls us all together. In church, we're all different members of the body. We all have different things to offer naturally. It's how God made us. In football, we have the receiver. He goes out and catches the ball. A lot of times, it's a very flashy position. It's really awesome. A lot of people want to do it. A lot of people don't want to do it. A lot of people don't want to get hit. But <laughs> it's a great position. It's really awesome. We have the quarterback. Makes the most money. He's always passing in front of everything. Everybody's like, man, I want to be the quarterback. The quarterback, he's like in the front. Everybody sees the quarterback. All the girls want to be him. All the boys, all the boys want to be him. But one thing about the quarterback, a lot of people don't know, it's one of the most sought out positions, right, in most any sports, right? There's a lot of weight that goes on a quarterback. There's a lot of weight that goes with leadership. A lot of people talk about they want to be a leader, right? They want to do all that stuff. It's a really funny quote, but it's like people say they want to yo, run a yacht, want a big boat. They don't really want a yacht or a big boat. They want the idea of a yacht, a big boat. If you gave them a yacht, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They, you know, they go on the high seas, they get seasick. <laughs> not, not to mention how to turn it on, how to steer it, how to get a crew to man it, how to get a crew to want to be with you to man it. You know, and then it goes into, to like, the upkeep and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of weight that falls on the quarterback soldiers. But there are people who call to do that. Now, a receiver can be a leadership in his, in his right. A quarterback is a leadership in his right. But also, not just the quarterback, you've also got these dudes, these bad dudes. That's your linemen. Linemen are the quarterback's absolute best friends <laughs> because without the linemen, the quarterback won't be such a pretty boy. <laughs> His nose be way over here. So, so you better respect your linemen. So, you have, so it's like everybody works, everything works together. So if you see where I'm going, you really see how this is like really working with life, right? How we're all coming together, we're all playing different parts, and we're all really building things together and beautifully. And I just thought, like, if I'm talking about, talking about this football team and sports team and stuff and everything, I'm going to be really honest. A lot of times, you know, we come to the church, we see the pastors or whoever's speaking and sharing, we see the worship team, right, they're up here, the lights hitting, all that kind of stuff or whatever, who's doing the announcements. Everybody doesn't see the people who's making stuff rock and roll. Kevin doing the cameras. You know, like Adam walking down the sound every Sunday making it sound good. Margo doing the slides and the lyrics in the back going around and around. Joey and Derek who are making sure everything smells good, looks good and amazing. She's also, and the boat also flying around on cameras, a video here and there and everywhere. And it's like, well, we take them a lot of times for granted because they're not in the flashiest and front and center limelight position. And so you take that for granted. But without them, how would you have church? You know, would you, no, this happened. Consequences. <laughs> That's called consequences. <laughs> you know, when, when a quarterback, you know, he's like, tweets his lineman dirty. <laughs> you know, he's all like, I'm me, myself, and I. You boys just do your thing or whatever. Just make sure I look good. Right? He's, going, he's taking all the PR thing. You know, he's not taking out good quarterbacks. No, man, good quarterbacks, they take care of the linemen. But bad quarterbacks, they just, the linemen just move aside and let them get crushed. So, and we don't, we, we show thankful and we're blessed to have our different team members here who make everything rock and roll, yeah. right? Yeah. Without everybody making everything rock and roll, you know, like, this mic would, wouldn't be working. You know, we play music, the drums would be all out of tune. You know, the keyboard wouldn't work. We, oh, just shut off in the middle of the set. And be like, got you then, didn't I? And they get up and walk out. No, <laughs> no. But we're blessed because the hearts are not like that. We're blessed because they love us, right? We're a team. We're all built together. And we want to go into the scripture that breaks this down about the, I know sometimes I talk a lot. Not sometimes, I talk a lot, I talk fast a lot of times. But anyways, I think it's really important to dive into the scripture that is soundly backing that up. 
So you hear both of us talk a lot about the one member is many bodies. Well, here's a scripture about that. It's Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, 27. But just as the body is one, it has many members. And all the members of, of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, what would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, what would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, and it goes on and on. It's really, it just keeps breaking it down. It breaks down the importance of like the unity of the body and how Christ intended for us all to be and to work in conjunction one with another. It's amazing. You know, I like what verse 12, verse 29 there. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Are, do all work miracles? Do all possess the gift of healings? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Do, but earnest. Earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. We all have different giftings of how God put us together. And we're like, it's beautiful we're talking about serving because, like, it was really powerful how, um, bring it back again. I, I love, like, what, as Derek and I were sharing about serving and, like, in the heart of, like, giving these things and how God wants to use us and to make a difference. It's like each of us have something to offer. Like, in this church, there's so many different ways you can help out. And a way you can march forward and further the kingdom. How you can further this team. There's so many different ways you can contribute. You may not even know. Because some of the greatest gifts we have, we take for granted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or maybe we don't take for granted. It's just like so natural because we've been working on it for so, such a long time. But you have something amazing to offer. I'm going to put some amazing people right now on the spot. But it's okay. Because <laughs> I, I think they can handle it. So at a, at a Bible study a couple of weeks ago, uh, I actually, I put my foot in my mouth, so I'm going to say it better this time. I noticed we have a lot of power couples in the church who have like, been married for long times, 30, 40, 50 years. They have a lot to offer, a lot that a lot of us can be really just benefit from. And it's like, okay, couples, new couples, you think about getting married, you know, relationship, whatever, make time. Go, like, bug some of these people. Like, learn, get some tips. I tell you what, like, I'm always, me and Kayla were always bugging um, Papa Kelly and Mama Tracy about stuff. And it's like, hey, you want to always, why? Because, like, not just my comparative nature, I always want to be great in sports or whatever. But, like, honestly, if I care about something, if you care about something, you want to improve at it. If you care about your relationship, work on it. Don't wait till it's on the rocks until you're, like, in a desperate area. Work on it now, ahead of time. Same way, you want to serve, like, God's bringing in a new pastor coming. There's a new season coming. Brother Derek talked about we're going to have the new drop-in center happening, right, after school programs. You know, and it's like, get plugged in now as far as leaders, of way how you can serve so you can learn. Don't wait until all the kids are coming and all the, the new pastors here, more people coming, everybody's so inspired. Like, oh, then you're like, oh, I think I'm going to try to learn how to do something. I think I'm going to try to learn how to work this camera. Oh, I think I'm going to try to learn how to serve here. Brothers and sisters, if you start now, just asking, hey, I want to train in something. I want to learn in something. I want to get better at something. By the time the seasons come and the cup is running over, yeah. you're there with your saucer. Right? Yeah. And so we just want to be ready. And so this is really cool. This is another benefit from Bible studies, right? Like I encourage like, all my brothers and sisters, find a, find a good group of Christian friends you can walk together in life, right? We got some good friends of ours, my wife and I, that we meet with some friends on like Tuesdays. And we, we do a Bible study, we crawl through, and we just like fellowship. Some nights we just like eat a bunch of junk food, <laughs> board games. But usually we always just dig through the work. We pick a book and we just we'll crawl through it, go through it until we get through that book. Then it's okay, next time let's figure out which book we're going to crawl through for the next few weeks or whatever. We were going through this one here, Matthew. Right now we're in Matthew chapter 5. Yeah. And this is a really good passage. I found it really, really awesome. And so I, wrote, I put it down as Christians as salt. Because, like, everything God does is a really cool reference, right? It's really cool. It's like a mystery waiting to be unpacked. There's something really awesome in it. So earlier I talked about, like, the, um, 
we're in the sun's atmosphere. And I thought it was really awesome because we're living in the sun and we're living in the sun. But I know we're speaking the English language, which is why it rhymes so awesome, right? Because it's like S-U-N, S-O-N. But this actually is Christ speaking himself that would work perfectly in any language because it's his words. You are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its favor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under the foot. You are the light of, you are the, light of the world, a city that is on a hill. Neither do men light a candle and put on a bushel, but a candlestick, but it giveth light unto all that are in our house, so let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father as heaven. This is a really powerful, special, awesome passage. A lot of times we talk about the light of the world, light on a candle, put your candle under a bush, right? And we'll solve the earth. But really, what stuck out to me, honestly, this time when we we're going through it, we read the scripture like bazillions of times. I don't know how many times you've read the scripture. But this time it really stood out to me was a salt reference. Because we're crawling over it. I think I'm talking too much. <laughs> Let me go here. And it's like, this one stuck up to me. It says, when it talks about you, the salt of the earth, but the salt lost the savor, where it shall be salted? It's a thing for good for nothing, to be cast out of man, to be trodden underfoot. Now, it's two part. The good part about it, it's pretty, well, I spit the hard part first. It's pretty, like, powerful and, like, drastic. It talks about, man, if you lose your Savior, you just be drawn and trying under your foot. That's pretty hardcore. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Like, Jesus would say that. But here's the good part, right, because it's, like it's like your salvation. It is pretty hard for salt to lose its flavor. Think about that. It's actually really hard. You ever put, like, you ever mess up and put too much salt in, your, <laughs> in a meal? You try, you try to cover that up? There's a couple of tricks you can do to kind of like add to it, to kind of distract your taste buds. You know, add lemon, add some ketchup or whatever. But that saltiness is still there. So, so that's a good thing. That's a good reminder that it's actually really hard to lose your salvation. Because when Christ loves you, he loves you. You have to actively be trying some hard stuff, to actively trying to get away from Christ. But so here's something really cool. I put out the pros and cons of salt because we're talking about teams, right? We're talking about serving. I thought this was really awesome because this is like Christians. This is what we do in our environment, what we can do to any team that we're on. Look at the pros. Salt it preserves, it flavors, it cleanses, it heals, it relieves muscle cramps, you know, treats sore throat, combats the sun. I usually treat sore throat spot a lot because like when my wife and I sing a lot, right? When your throat gets all hurt, you got to go all that, right? You got to use it to heal it and honey and all that kind of stuff. But... Let's think of the preserving, the flavor, the cleanses, and the heals. And we look at the cons over there. It's amazing that it's like some of it do too much of it. Does the opposite of the very things it helps with. And if you look at it as Christians in Christian society, when we're in Christ and we're allowing God to use us, this is how we benefit our countries, our communities, our church, our workplaces. We, pre we preserve it. We help the company prosper. We help the church thrive. Flavor, we got a little bit of pizzazz because we have the gifts of the Spirit that God gave to us. That's pretty amazing. The Holy Spirit, God has blessed you with something that is special and unique that you have. To being, to, you are a difference maker. Cleanses, we help to keep things pure. Heals, we can help heal the sick. We can help heal in so many. We can help share and comfort people. But let's jump over to the right side with the cons. The cons, this is what happened when you put too much of yourself in it, right? Like even when you try, even a, a blessing said the wrong way can be counted a curse. You know, you want to go out and share the gospel, but you're doing with a bam, hammer and a chisel. You know, and you're like trying to help somebody, but you're driving further away, you're harming them. They can't hear the gospel that you're supposed to be sharing because all they're doing is hearing you, right? The gospel that you're supposed to be sharing because all they're doing is hearing you, right? You can't taste the flavor for, of the, which you in the essence, salt's supposed to bring out the flavor of everything else, accentuate all the other flavors in the meal. All you're tasting is the salt, right? And so we just got to make sure that we grow and we let Christ thrive and come through us and speak through us when we're sharing or anything we're a part of. That's another part that has to do with, like, children and parents. Children, obey your parents to the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment where I promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's so beautiful. Everything is constantly just like, there's so many things you can find that directs our conduct. It's in family, society. It's, it's all there, people. It's all, it's all in the scripture. 
If you need a place, you need to know where to look, you got a lot of mentors. You got a lot of people you can go chat with. There's a lot of people who've been other Christians, who've been a Christian a long time, who's really versed in the scripture. Go ahead, come to the Bible studies. You know, like, the, we actually encourage conversation. <laughs> you know, dig into the word and talk about it and, like, listen together. You have an idea. There's something you've been mulling over for a while. You never know. One of your brothers and sisters got the answers. Parenting, this is my parents, Ron and Victoria. My dad passed on in 2010. He's resting with the Lord. My mom is still here. They did a lot of stuff in their life. This is some history, some photos of some stuff my dad did, dad and mom. A lot of times my dad, my mom was in the shadows, but she was straight up supporting my dad. They worked a tight team. On the left side, that's in Hawaii. That's a, those two pictures there, that's a football stadium. There's massive art all over the outside of the football stadium, all these places, the halftime shows, a bunch of crazy stuff. On the top right, that's inside of a nuclear submarine for the United States military. And the, and the frigates and the safeguards and submarines all over the military bases for our service men and women. You can't go there unless you get top classified clearance stuff. The bottom right one, that's in Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. In the 80s, 70s, they had the number one studio gallery there for many, many years, featuring MTV, all that stuff. Did art music at the same time. All these rich and famous people, they did art music, all that stuff. If you had a Grammy trying to get one, they worked with you, trained your bands, all that kind of stuff. But in the middle, the things that are more important, that's the core. In the middle is when my parents decided to start teaching their children music and art and everything. Parenting. Before all that, and that's something that I'm constantly, I'm still learning with, right? It's like, you hear all this stuff, you see how your parents do amazing things, but honestly, when you're just a student and you're putting into action, it's just all theory, right? So, like, I grew up hearing my dad and mom preach about all this stuff, and they're like, you know, forget about all the stuff we've done in our careers. If I'm not a dad, it doesn't matter, right? If I'm not a mom, it doesn't matter. If I'm not your friend, it doesn't matter, right? So when they took the time out for the kids, that was the most important. Here's where I grew up. The top, that was, that's our home. That's the front, like, that would be the living room of your home. It was completely open to the public, performing music there, 8 a.m. in the morning till sometimes 10 p.m., 8 p.m., whatever. People come in, perform music, record music, writing stuff on the spot, training, every instrument, whatever. There's three signs in the middle. The top one, you can't read it because it's so small away, but it's really special. It says, for 50 years, Ron Artis performed music with everybody. For the rest of his, year, rest of his years, the rest of his life, only with his family. He decided, you know what? I gave all that time to everybody. Just, I just want to be a dad. No more on the road, just being, right, just being there, training on Here, my mom. So the bottom side is all the art and all that stuff. But besides, like I talked about, right, none of that stuff, all that stuff was all good and well. Helped make a living, names, all that kind of stuff. But telling a short story, like, when my dad really served me, when my dad served me, I can tell many stories. But one story I'm going to say, it was the best gift I can get, actually. It's my 18th birthday. On my 18th birthday, a bunch of friends are having a birthday party for me down the street at their big restaurant. They're all waiting. We we're closing down the shop, going to head down there. Some people came in, this couple. And my dad ended up like, talking and then preaching to them the whole time. See, besides the house being a studio gallery, it was actually a little church. And like, I would see admirals coming there. He'd give them parenting advice and be preaching for a long time. I remember, though, on this birthday in particular, I was distracted. Because, see, as a newly 18-year-old boy, I was idolizing my friends, my birthday party. I was putting that before what God was doing. Still to this day, I can't remember exactly what the details of that conversation was that my dad was having with that couple. I just remember he was preaching, he was preaching, and I watched the time go from 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 12.30 a.m., and they're just talking, this couple was just bawling and crying, and he's just like preaching the whole time, talking right there, and I'm thinking, man, my friends are down the street, my friends are down the street, we're gonna, we're gonna miss it, we're gonna miss it, we're gonna miss it, we're gonna miss it. You know what, though? The reason why I say it's one of the greatest gifts I ever received, because now looking back at that 18th-year-old birthday, it's a reminder that when God is doing something, you stop and drop everything you're doing, and you be present for what God is doing. You know, and so as a newly 18-year-old young man, young boy, that was one of the greatest gifts I could ever receive. You know, and it's like now when I make plans, I tell somebody I'm going to be somewhere, I'm going to do something in my heart, and I try, to, I try to say to them, hey, like, Lord willing, it's if God wants me to do it. Then I'll be there. My mom served me. I took him ready to close. Lost this connection here. Go to the next slide, please. I say my mom served me when, when I was younger, even though I'm able to talk and, sh and speak right now and share, actually, I had a really bad stutter. 
I didn't talk much, and when I did, I had a massive stutter. I just couldn't get over it. But my mom really helped me with singing. Now you guys hear I love serving in worship. I love singing a lot. Mom helped me with singing. Singing helped me to speak. So I'm so passionate about music therapy and teaching music. Because even if you don't do music for a living, it can really help you. My mom helped me with songwriting, which helped me convey my thoughts and get it out to be able to express. So both of those things have been a blessing. That's two ways of my parents served me. As we bring it to the end, we're serving, making the difference, and being that difference. Each and every one of us can truly make a difference in our team, in this church, in our life, and beyond. When we truly make ourselves open and available to serve God and to serve our community and serve other people. You know, we talked about some really things that are dear and close to your heart. You would say, okay, I want to serve the youth because I love young people. I want to serve and help out with seniors because I love seniors. I want to serve in the worship team because I love music. Let's just take those first two things, I love. Let's take the second thing, love. We start there. Start with love. Start with being love, be humble, and allow God to work through you because God is love. God bless you. Thank you so much to the congregation for being so supportive and loving. And thank you to our speakers, Stefan and Derek. I cannot believe the amount of talent that God has blessed our church with. We are so fortunate. We are so lucky. So if you felt moved on your heart today to get involved, to start laying those bricks for that next generation. There are so many areas that you can get involved with. Come see us at the Hub. And honestly, the first thing I want to tell you to do is take our Next Steps classes. Because that way, you can get involved, you can hear what Case believes, you can hear our story, you can get to know what our core values and our principles are that we live by. And then the last step, is to get involved. Yeah? Okay, good. All right, so before we leave today, I want to leave you with the benediction. At the end of every service, we like to leave you with the priestly blessings. So you guys can stand to your feet. If you know it, you can say it with me. If you want to receive it, just hold out your hands. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Have a great week, everyone. Don't forget to join us in the lounge for refreshments, and we will see you on Thursday for Bible study. Have a great week.